1989, MPs from across a range of parties stood in Parliament to vote in favour of the Reserve Bank Act, severing the ability of our government to control New Zealand's monetary policy. A year before the law was passed, then Prime Minister David Longy had appointed a young economist named Don Brash to serve as the governor of the bank. At the time, New Zealand's inflation rate stood at just over 6%. In the years preceding the Act's passage, it was closer to 15%. But within just two years, Brash's actions would lower it to just 2%, where it has remained ever since. So how did he do it? Welcome to the Road to the Modern Economy. In our last episode, we discussed the Great Depression and the insights of John Maynard Keynes. Today we're going to be looking at the crisis through a different lens, using the ideas of two American economists, Milton Friedman and Anna Schwartz. In 1929, as the global economy was slowly collapsing, Milton Friedman had just graduated from a small public high school in New Jersey. By the time the crisis ended, the economist had completed his undergraduate and graduate education, multiple academic fellowships, and a stint as an administrator in Franklin Delano Roosevelt's government. At this point in Friedman's life, he was a Keynesian, Given the devastation brought on by the Great Depression, he supported many parts of the New Deal, recognising the need for the US government to directly increase the level of demand within the economy through public spending program. Over the course of his career, Friedman's work spanned across the entirety of economics, from ideas about the role of government to the behaviour of consumers. But it was his collaboration with the economic historian Anna Schwartz that would go on to have the most profound impact on economic policy. Rethinking Economics is currently looking for volunteers interested in helping to organise a review of economics curricula at universities across the country. For more information, feel free to check out our website RethinkEconomics.co.nz. In early October, Rethinking Economics New Zealand will be hosting an event featuring Dr. Marilyn Warren. In the mid 1930s, Anna Schwartz had just graduated with an economics degree from Columbia University and was working there as a researcher. Over the course of five years, she worked on an ambitious project that collected and analysed the British economy of the 17 and 1800s. When Schwartz and the other researchers completed their work in 1943, the group had compiled an expansive information set containing nearly every available piece of data about the British economy um, over the course of multiple centuries. Like Friedman, at the start of her career, Schwartz's beliefs about the causes of recessions and depressions weren't very different from those of Keynes himself. She and the other authors of the study argued that periods of economic hardship begin when people stop consuming, which then caused businesses to reduce their level of investment, reducing the total demand for goods within the economy. And the similarities to Keynes didn't end there. 
In her earlier work, Schwartz argued that the economy would only become self-correcting once declines in investment begin to affect the supply of goods. Like Keynes, she realized that when the supply of goods fell, prices would adjust and demand would then rise, allowing the economy to recover. But just months after the project ended, she'd already begun to question her own work. As impressive as the study had been, many economists quickly realized that something was missing. Money. When the project was completed, the United States was basking in the glory that followed its victory in World War II and enjoying the newfound prosperity that ended the misery of the 1930s. While Schwartz's own beliefs were changing, just a few hours away in Illinois, Milton Friedman had returned to academia. Just before the war ended, he left Roosevelt's government to accept a job as a professor at the newly formed Economics Department at the University of Chicago. As a graduate student and researcher, Friedman had already established himself as one of the United States' premier monetary economists. Within a few months, Schwartz reached out to him marking the start of a collaboration that would go on for decades. In order to understand the role of money in the economy, Schwartz and Friedman decided to look at the economic history of their own country. Like with their work on the British economy, the pair began by collecting an enormous quantity of data about the American economy, dating back to the mid-1800s. However, unlike her study of the British economy. Schwartz's work on American economic history focused almost exclusively on the effect of money on the country's economy. The pair created various metrics to measure the country's money supply, which they then examined over time. While Schwartz's first project took just five years to complete, her second would only finish in 1967 nearly 20 years after the pair first met. Over those years, Schwartz's view on the drivers of economic activity and inflation changed dramatically. She and Friedman noticed that across the span of multiple decades, inflation tended to rise whenever the amount of money circulating in the economy grew at a faster rate than the economy itself. This was in contrast to her earlier view that inflation would only rise when the effective demand for goods outpaced the supply for goods. When they eventually published their book in 1969, it presented economists with an alternative to Keynes's ideas. But at first, most economists rejected it, or rather they ignored it. After all, the nearly 20 years that followed World War II had been defined by the adoption of Keynes' ideas by policymakers, governments routinely and successfully intervened in the economy when unexpected shocks occurred. But around half a decade later, in the mid-1970s, economists across the globe watched as inflation began to skyrocket, while demand remained consistent. Throughout the decade, Keynesian policymakers spent countless hours trying to solve the problem to little avail. In academia, however, researchers began to borrow Friedman and Schwartz's insights to analyse the economy. By the end of the decade, a new generation of politicians and policymakers who were outwardly antagonistic to the role of government interventions in the economy rose to power. In the United States, Jimmy Carter suffered through a historic loss at the 1980 election, with Ronald Reagan taking the reins as president. In the United Kingdom, Margaret Thatcher campaigned on a platform that promised to curb inflation through monetary policy actions and reduce the role of government across the economy. And right here in New Zealand, after the 1984 general election, We became the latest country to embrace Friedman's views on the economy. 
So going back to Brash, one of the tools that the Reserve Bank used in the late 1980s was their ability to change the amount of money that banks held at any given time. When banks increased the amount of money that they held, less money would circulate within the economy. For decades, monetarist ideas formed the basis of most public responses to crises. Whenever the economy faced a shock, policymakers would simply alter interest rates. But then 2008 happened. The economy faced the global economy had faced shocks before, but none as significant as the global financial crisis. Within months, governments across the world began to realise that ending the crisis would take more than simply changing the interest rate or the money supply. In the United States, the United Kingdom, China and nearly every other major economy, governments pumped trillions of dollars into their economies, preventing a second depression. Once the crisis ended, Politicians, once again, began to readopt many of Keynes' core ideas, recognising the importance of government action in preventing economic disruptions from spiralling. To this day, central banks continue to dictate the monetary policies of most countries, using ideas that are based around Friedman and Schwartz's view on inflation and the role of money.